what I'd like to do is um, now stop and we'll go maybe take some time to go over the, uh, the homework before the exam and, and answer, try to answer any questions you might have had. Let's start with chapter, uh, problem set five, which is chapter five material. First 5.2, I don't think anybody had any particular problem with that one. That was simply using the Nernst equation and the uh, and the, not the Nernst equation, but the Cottrell equation plus the spherical aspect of it to derive an equ uh, to derive a, um, to get the current information out of it. And that's an uh, equation in the book, so that wasn't a, a problem. Let's go to, uh, anybody have any question about that? I don't think there should be any question. Okay. Uh, let's go to 5.3, which is uh, would turn out to have a little bit more trouble for you guys, some of you anyway. Um, basically, what you, what you want to do is plot the potential versus the log of ID minus I over I to get the uh, to get the to get the number of electrons. This plot should have a slope of 59.1 over n millivolts at 25 degrees C. If you do that plot, where ID is 3.24 microamps, and that, I don't think I have that plot. I don't, I think I just did it on my calculator. What you see is a slope of 29 millivolts. So that suggests that the number of electrons is equal to two. And we can do this analysis because we have some additional information. It's reverse, it says it's a reversible polar graphic wave. If we didn't have a reversible polar graphic wave, this analysis would not be that useful to us because the slope would now depend on the rate of electron transfer, which we didn't, wouldn't know necessarily. But since we have that information that's reversible, we can use the fact that that slope should be 59 millivolts. It actually, or 59 over one n millivolts, it's actually 29 millivolts, so n must be equal to two. Um, the formal potential can be derived by looking at the half wave potential, and that half wave potential is available from the half current point, ID over 2. And you have to interpolate that a little bit. It's somewhere between minus 0.415 and minus 0.422. I got a value of minus 0.417 volts versus SCE, which turns out to be, or the requested versus NHE is minus 0.658 volts. And uh, for some reason, some of you had some problems with that. But that's E1 half is equal to E0, the formal potential when the diffusion coefficients are equal, and it's a reversible system. Excuse me? Minus 0.658 volts versus NHE. 0.658. Can we zoom in on that a little bit, Rob? Yeah. Okay. I'm not sure how to be even versus NHE or? Well, that's what it says in the book. Okay. It doesn't have to be, but. Uh, the derivation 5.8, I'm not going to go through that. Uh, I think um, pretty much everybody could do that. You could follow along. It will be on the web page if you want to see that. Um, 5.9, <clears throat> the data for an irreversible, apparently totally irreversible wave. So here we get a system now where it's not reversible. We have to use a little bit more information to get the, the data that we want. Well, we can use the, um, the data that we're given. The, the limiting current, I sub D, is going to be the uh, 3.1, which you can see from, the, from the, just the table of numbers.
Um, and you can get uh, the fusion coefficient from the from the limiting current three times seven to the minus six. Pretty much everybody got that. You can find uh, chi by interpolating the values from the table, and that's what I had to do. Is I took the table numbers. I forget which table that was from. Table five point five one. Yeah, that's on page 170. And then you can get the values of chi. You have to interpolate given, um, given the current val I over ID values. And I did that, and I've got a, a spreadsheet. What I'll do is I'll put up my spreadsheet on the, on the web page if you want to verify what you get. You can be able to find alpha and sub A and k sub F from that, from that information. Since you know what uh, chi is, you can calculate k sub F at any particular point. And um, then from the slope, you can get uh, alpha n sub a. And I got, for that, minus 23.89. For the slope, minus 19.34 for kf, or for the intercept, which is, the intercept will be k0, uh, f, or k0. So 0 0.614 for alpha n sub a, k0 f, 3.99 times 7 to the minus 9 centimeters per second. So a fairly slow electron transfer rate in there. There's an alternate treatment that the book talks about by Maitis in Israel, where you can plot the potential versus the log of ID minus I over I. That should be, uh, for irreversible waves, should be linear with a slope of 54.2 over alpha n sub a. Notice the difference. This is a, in 5.2, a reversible wave has a slope of 59 mil over n millivolts. This has a 54.2 over alpha n sub a. So, Given the slope that you got, you can get alpha n sub a of 0.598. And uh, I think one of the problems somebody had was um, they used natural log instead of log there. And that obviously changes the number. Forget where that treatment of mites in Israel is listed. Anyway, once you get that number, you can get from the intercept the E one half value of minus 0.505, and given that information from E one half, you can back calculate the value of k sub f, k zero f, using that equation here. That's in the book. And that's 5.27 times 7 minus 9. So we get pretty much the same alpha n sub a value in the two cases, which is a good indication that we're on the right track. Also, the k0 value is within 100% uh, of the right value, which is not too bad, actually, for these two disparate methods of calculation. Um, the first method is probably significantly better than the second method, uh, but the second met method is a faster method in principle, anyway. So that's not too bad. So that's reasonable agreement within a factor of two. The third one, uh, all of you tried to do it the hard way, but that actually turns out that um, a much simpler way of doing this calculation, uh, given the information from fixed first law, we can actually derive in a relationship between the current over NFA KF is equal to the concentration on the electrode surface. C0 T over T. So you don't have to use error functions or error function complements to do this thing. Just a few simple calculations to find the uh, area. And uh, you already know KF, and so you can plot that here, and that's just plot. I've multiplied this by five to, to get it on the same scale, basically. So here's your limiting current, or your current. Here's your um, C sub zero value. So may have a question about that, that problem. I think if you if you the the equation if you use that equation you can get the right you can get the same curve so that I didn't take any points away from you for that but I'm just pointing the uh, you can do the the derivation 
Um, since you know from fixed first law, the tip current is proportional to the gradient of the concentration. Um, that gives you directly the, the value of the concentration at the electrode surface. Okay. What about, since hearing no significant questions, what about number um, six? Okay, problem set six. Number six, we're, uh, we're talking about chapter um, six, the CV type, type stuff, and so we'll start with chat pay, uh, problem 6.2. Um, and that's simply correctly using those tables, which uh, can be tricky. So the idea here was to calculate, it says for several values of K sub zero with alpha of a certain value and so on. Compare the results with a Nernstein reaction. Uh, since we're gonna talk about irreversible kinetics, you should use K zeros that would be appropriate for irreversible kinetics, at least a few anyway. And so I picked, I see that from the equation that they talked about, K zero would have to be greater than, or less than 6.3 times 10 to the minus six, so I used 10 to the minus seven, 10 to the minus eight, 10 to the minus nine, actually 10 to the minus 10 centimeters per second in my table. The potential on that table, 6.31, you have to look at, on the, uh, in the footnotes, it says the potential scale is E minus E zero prime times alpha N sub A plus RT over F times natural log of square root of pi D zero B divided by K zero, which is here and B is alpha and so they F, uh, F is the FR over RT times V. So a practical potential scale would be put plotting E minus E zero uh, on this, in this particular case. So that's what I did is I took E minus E zero as our scale and calculating the rest, you get the data that we see here. And this graph didn't show up very well, but it's, on the, it's better on the web page. And here's the data for 10 to the minus 7, 10 to the minus 8, 10 to the minus 10. Where is N A there? Well, N is the, the alpha is 0.5 and N, is, N sub A is 1, so. That's N A was in the program as well? Uh -huh. Yeah. Anyway, they, the, uh, it turned out I didn't, I guess there was, um, well two of them at least didn't have the right potential scan. I couldn't quite figure out what the difference was based on their data. So I, um, if, um, if you can convince me that's just right, I can, I'll maybe change something, but I didn't, I didn't see that was right. On my data initially was, seemed to be here and, um, then you can, what you do basically is that just scales that this, the set of numbers in the table by the, for the, on a potential scale. So it just shifts the actual potential away from this potential and that's what you see. So this 10 to the minus 7th, 10 to the minus 8th, 10 to the minus 10th. Also note that you see a, a shift of 59 millivolts divided by alpha N sub A for every decade change in rate. So if you look from 10 to the minus 7th to 10 to the minus 8th, you'll see 112 millivolts, 118 millivolts for the um, shift, and that's what you'd expect. That was uh, 59 over uh, 0.5. And so the shift is correct anyway. So that's the first part of that thing. It says compare these results with those for a Nernstein reaction. Nernstein reaction uses a different table, but you can still plot E minus E zero using a different uh, conversion, but that's here. 
and, uh, and it's E0 as close to E1 half as you expect, not exactly. Notice the current function is plotted here, that's what it asks you to plot, um, but if you plot the actual current, you see a change in the uh, relative peak heights. The reversible peak height is always larger than the irreversible peak height. So at least one of you did that, and, and when you do that, you'll see the peak current here is larger than these other ones. So, the, but to calculate the current, you have to go through the procedure. That's again in the footnote. So that is, because of those tables are a little confusing, and they're not always so easy. But you might want to make sure you did that right. Number 6.4, um, talks about an experiment where you oxidize uh, orthodianisidine. A two electron process gives you the, gives you the particulars of the reaction. They use a scan rate of half a volt per minute, which is kind of old fashioned. That's a long, that's an experiment that was done quite a while ago. Uh, nobody really reports in volts per minutes anymore. Uh, but that converts over to 8.33 millivolts per second, which is what you need for your equation for the, the peak current and the linear sweep voltammetry, which is right in the front cover. Put those numbers in, you get a value of, for diffusion coefficient of 3.62 times 10 to the minus 6 centimeters squared per second. And they ask you what the peak is at 100 millivolts per second. That's just the ratio of the, the scan rate. The, the square root of the ratio of the scan rate. So if we take the original data at 8.33 and you take that ratio of 100 over 8.33 times the one half square root of that, it gives you 28.4. Similar deal with uh, 550 millivolts per second gives you 72.5 microamps. So that's proper use of the equations is all that requires. 6.6 six, um, talks about some experimental data with iron phthalocyanine, uh, FEPC, and imidazole. Um, imidazole is, a, is um, a base, as you might expect. So what's the, it asks you what the, what's going on here, and you can imagine that the, if you look on the um, 6.92, you can see the two peaks. curve and so it says without any imidazole in there you get uh, two peaks and what's the likely thing of that? Well the likely thing of that is a probably it's a two electron overall two electron process and each peak corresponds to a one electron process. You could think of it as two separate two electron processes that that would require um, you know some that doesn't seem very reasonable for iron in oxidation state. So it's probably more reasonable to think about as two one electron waves. And the peak separation is more reasonable for a one electron process. So just by looking at it, you can probably think it's a one electron process. So the overall process is probably um, iron FEPC plus one electron to the anion and then another electron to the dianion. Notice the, it's 1.18 millimolar, this, um, initial material, if you add 10 millimolar of the imidazole, the peaks change quite dramatically. If you change it, add by, you add almost a mole of imidazole, a mole, one molar concentration of imidazole, you see a, the peaks have shifted dramatically. The second wave hardly changes at all, but the first wave changes dramatically. And so, what's the, ask what the explanation for that is, and, um, The explanation is obviously there's some sort of interaction with the first, in the first process with the base, uh, the imidazole. So probably what's happening is there's a complex that's forming with the iron and the, the nitrogens on the imidazole, which causes the reaction to become less reversible and to shift to more negative potential. It makes it more harder to reduce. Once you've reduced it, however, it's likely that that imidazole uh, complex formation is less likely. You've for, you added a negative charge to that molecule, so the negative charge probably eliminates that complex 
and so it's not as likely to form. And so the second wave is pretty much unaffected by the imidazole that's present in solution. And, uh, and uh, I'm sure given a little bit more information by reading the, the, um, the actual article, you could come up with some more conclusions about it. But that's about all you can say based on what's in the, um, what's in the uh, CV. Let's see, now, number 6.8. azotoluene <laughs> gives you some information um, for this particular reaction. There's two waves. I ask you to make any conclusions you can about those reversibility of those waves and, and so on. Well, the first wave, you can analyze it in a couple different ways. First of all, you notice that the EPA and EPC values pretty much rock steady on at those values. They don't shift with the scan rate. Also the ratio of I, the, the peak current for the anodic and cathodic process is one, or pretty close to one for all the all the scan rates. Peak separation is 59 over N millivolts or 59 millivolts as expected for a reversible voltammogram. So those three sets of data suggest that you've got a reversible electron transfer process, reversible CV wave. Uh, from that reversible data, you can get some more information. If you if you, now that you know it's a, it's reversible, you can get the E zero from the average values of the forward and the reverse peaks, and so E zero for the peak one is about one minus one point three nine. The diffusion coefficient can be arrived by using the, the peak current equation from CV. And you could pick one of the scan rates, but a more reasonable way to do it would be either to plot the, say, IP over V to the one half versus V and get a slope. Or you could just take the average value, take find a IP over V to the one half and put that in this equation here to get an average value. I did that. I get 1.73 times 10 to the minus 5 centimeters squared per second. So the first wave pretty much can get all that information out of it. The second wave, uh, you see right away just from the tabulated data, there's no uh, IPA given. So that suggests that there is no reverse wave or nothing that you can measure an IP on. There's also no uh, reverse, uh, there's no potential given for a reverse wave. So that suggests there's no reverse wave there. Um, also, they're given a EP minus EP over 2. And you can look at that and see that that changes from 80 to 100 millivolts uh, at higher scan rates, suggesting that there is some irreversibility in the system. IP, though, with as a function of scan rate to the one half power, IP divided by the V to the one half, should be constant for reversible processes and completely irreversible processes, but not for quasi-reversible processes. So that suggests that since that's constant, that is an irreversible wave and not quasi-reversible wave. The question is, is this as a irreversible wave because of a chemical process or is it irreversible because of electron transfer kinetics? And um, the fact that it doesn't, the peak currents do not shift with scan rate suggests that it's not irreversible due to uh, electron transfer process. If it was an irreversible wave that um, was due to electron transfer rate constants, as we go, it went from say 73 to 430, we would see a significant shift in the peak potentials, almost 50 millivolts or more. And we don't see that. So that suggests that the irreversibility is arising from some other process, and most likely due to a follow-up chemical reaction. In other words, you've made uh, 
probably a diana in form of this azotoluene, which uh, probably is easily protonated by something impurities in solution or even the solvent. And that then is no longer a reversible process due to the chemical step that's occurring. So, and you can see the second wave is a one electron wave because the peak current for the first wave, which is specified as being one electron by coulometry, is similar into the value of the peak current for the second wave. So that suggests that the second wave is reversible. That also means that it's likely that um, you can calculate a diffusion coefficient for the second wave in a similar manner to the first wave, except that the diffusion coefficient would just be an estimate because, because of the follow-up chemical reaction, the peak currents does not follow the same theory as a, for a reversible reaction or for, for irreversible due to electron transfer rates or irreversible due to chemical process. So the diffusion coefficient would be similar to the first wave as you'd expect, but so you'd just be an estimate. You'd have to say, well, this is just an estimate of the diffusion coefficient. So, any questions about that particular part? Okay. Once we still have some more time, let's talk about then chapter. Uh, Set number seven, which is in chapter 12. We haven't turned that in yet, but you will at the end of the day. So let's talk about that. Chapter 12, it's, you had to, there's some things in here that since we skipped, there might be some information that's not, you might have to go back and look about in other chapters. But let's look at a couple of, of questions. First question, 12.5, um, seemed to be interesting to a lot of you guys because you uh, all asked me about it. So why do we view adsorbed neutral species as being intimately bound to the electrode surface rather than being collected in the diffuse layer? So if we look at 12.5 from that idea, it says why are neutrals thought to be on the surface. So we can think of water dipoles. Being present on the surface and then we can think of a neutral molecule being on the surface. And then we can think of the OHP being here and then neutrals present throughout the solution, but not specifically thought to be, well, not non-specifically adsorbed. So the only thing we're thinking about here is that neutrals are specifically adsorbed to the electrode surface, but not non-specifically adsorbed. We know neutrals can adsorb to the surface, but we see their effect on the, the uh, differential capacity curves. Again, remember the definition for adsorption is a surface excess. So neutrals can be present near the electrode surface and still not be considered to be adsorbed because they're not present in, in excess over what you would normally see in any other volume of solution. So near the electrode surface, there's one amount of neutrals uh, not if we exclude specifically the surface, but near, near the electrode surface, there's no more neutrals than there is anywhere else outside the uh, in vicinity of the electrode. So that suggests that the neutrals are not absorbed non-specifically. So why would they be only not specifically absorbed and not non-specifically absorbed? We know there are some, is absorption, so why only specific absorption? Well, remember the reason why these other materials are gonna be attracted to the electrode surface. There is an electrostatic attraction between, say, a negatively charged electrode surface and positively charged cations. And cations are solvated, so they can only approach to within a certain distance, the outer Helmholtz plane. 
neutral molecules, because they have no charge, are not strongly attracted by electrostatic interactions. There's really no handle for that electrostatic attraction to grab onto. So they can be present in, in solution and not really feel that effect. They can, however, diffuse to the electrode surface and displace by, say, just some uh, running into the water molecule, it could displace one and be stuck on the electrode surface there because of some chemisorption or some physical interaction or chemical interaction of that neutral molecule with the surface. Uh, and so they can be stuck to the surface, but they're not present in excess near the electrode surface because there's no reason for them to be so. Now there is an, neutrals can have dipole moments, either permanent or um, or induced, but the dipole moments generally are not strong enough to really overcome the normal solvent forces. These are going to be jostled around by the water molecule, so there's no, there's probably no um, reason for them to be stuck near the electro surface due solely to that dipole interaction. There's not enough force to overcome the solvent and thermal jostling that they would otherwise see. Oh. About 12, uh, any questions about that? Let's look at 12.6 then. <laughs> so interpret the data in 12.9.1 and 12.9.2. Let's look at those. That's here. 12.9.1, 12.9.2. Electrocapillary occurs for mercury in contact with 0.5 molar sodium sulfate in the presence of absence of n heptanol. So you can see with the uh, sodium sulfate alone, you see a nice semi parabolic curve, which is what you'd expect for the surface tension versus potential. With the heptanol in solution, you get a flattened top and uh, away from the center point, the, it's uh, reasonable. What about 12.9.2? Uh, this is the differential capacitance curves for the uh, system. And so you see the capacitance increases markedly near that, near a, in a couple points, and then drops to very low levels, and then increases again and drops again. So it says interpret those data. What implications can be derived? How do the traces in figure 12.9.2 relate to those, to those in figure 12.9.1? What implications can be derived from the flat region in the electrocapillary curves in the presence of N-heptal alcohol? Construct a chemical model to explain a very low differential capacitance. And can you provide a formal mathematical rationale for the sharp peaks in C sub D? Can you rationalize them chemically? So you had to think about this one a little bit. Uh, the flat region implies that uh, the surface tension is not affected by potential much in that region, right? So what's that mean? That means that there is no change in the amount of absorbed material with potential on, in that flat region of the curve. So it's likely that near the PZC, the point of zero charge, our neutrals have absorbed and they're not being removed by any process. There's not more water being absorbed, there's not more ions being absorbed because there's a fairly large amount of this material absorbed to the electrode surface, the neutral molecule. Once the potential becomes significantly higher or lower than a certain amount, then the water dipoles can reassert their attractive force to the electrode surface and uh, other molecules. And I guess going back to the spikes, it says since the differential capacitance curves are the second derivative of the, of the um, surface tension, that's just a consequence of the fact that your, your slope is changing dramatically in those regions. And so that's just a second derivative effect. Um, so that's the mathematical 
r reason for that. Uh, the spikes are a consequence of the abrupt change in the slope in the neutral absorbed region. The near zero capacitance is a consequence of the derivative of a nearly constant signal, right? Because the, because the, um, at this point there's basically a flat potential, there's flat value. When you do the derivative of that, the second derivative is also flat. So that's why we get a very low near zero value. So I drew a little simplified model of our experiment where you had two slopes up and down. This is the derivative, as you can see of that. I don't know if you can zoom in on that a little bit, Rob. There we go. And then you can see the, the spikes that you'd expect. So that's why we see this basic looking curve. And of course, there's not, it's not exactly flat. And so we don't see exactly a zero value. Now the chemical rationale of the low capacitance in the neutral absorption region is due to the increased distance imposed between the, um, between the uh, surface and the adsorbed solution species. So since we have these neutrals near the electrode surface, we've increased the distance between whatever molecules are coming in. The other reason is that the dielectric constant of the neutrals may be different than the dielectric constant of the water. Remember, water has a fairly high dielectric constant, um, 78 out in solution, but when it's lined up on the electric surface, it's about seven or eight. But for a neutral, say organic, that dielectric constant may be two or three. And so that's another reason for the, the capacitance to drop because the dielectric value is, is gone. Now the peaks are a consequence of the sudden change in order of the as the neutrals enter and leave the IHP. As that the film becomes more disordered, at the point just at the point where the neutrals start to leave, now there is much more opportunities for our ions to get in and out near the electrode surface. So that disorder gives them an opportunity to be closer to the electrode surface, which increases the capacitance markedly. But once we get past that point, then the water molecules now become oriented and that forms a sort of shield on the surface where now the capacitance stabilizes at a higher value than before. And um, the spikes on either side are nearly symmetrical for that reason because they're, they're, doing, they're seeing the same basic effect. So that's kind of an interesting result, I think. It's interesting data. 12.9. So the absorption of a certain substance X follows the Langmuir isotherm saturation coverage of the material is A times 10 to the minus 10 moles per cubic centimeter. And beta is 5 times 10 to the minus 7 cubic centimeters per mole, assuming the activity is equal to the concentration. At what concentration of X will the electrode surface be half covered, i.e. theta is equal to 1 half, sketch the absorption isotherm of um, the substance. At what concentration of X will a linearized isotherm be valid to 1%? Um, well, you get the concentration. You can find the uh, concentration of X for a linearized isotherm. Um, concentration of X would be, as I found, uh, 20 micromolar. I, I don't have all the data there, but that's just the, using the linear isotherm to calculate that number. <laughs> Part A? Part A, yeah. Uh, is it? Yeah, what concentration? For half coverage. For half coverage, yeah, for half coverage. Half coverage. Because theta over 1 minus theta is equal to beta times C. Mm -hmm. Theta is uh, 0. 0.5. 0. 0.5. That would be one. So one concentration of X is one over beta. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Okay. But it's it's a twenty micromolar. Yeah, that's what I got. Beta is five times ten to the seventh, right? Yeah. So one over five times ten to the seventh is two times ten to the eighth moles per cubic centimeter. Yeah. Oh it's not twenty micromolar. It's, it's uh well, it's 20, it's 2 times 10 to the 8th. Yeah, it's 20, it's 2 times 10 to the minus 5 moles per liter. 
Twenty microliter. Not two hundred micro. What's the the plot of that is shown here. I'll put that on the notes too on the web too. You can see the plot. Here's the linearized region. Here's the the um, the other plot for different concentrations. The linear region extends over a, a smaller region, obviously. I just use the equations in the book. When uh, 1 plus beta C sub i is less than 1.01, .01, we should get a linearized form. Just have to solve then for um, BC is e beta C is equal to 0 0.01, and that's a uh, concentration of Two times ten to the minus ten moles per cubic centimeter, I guess, or less. Okay. Twelve sixteen. Calculate the values of sigma to the m corresponding to various values of phi two. So minus point two to plus point two for a mercury electrode and 0.01 molar sodium fluoride based on the GCS Gooey Chapman Stern model. Plot phi two versus sigma m from the variation. Hmm? We have one minute. All right. Well, we should. Uh, anyway, the uh, plot is here. I don't. You could use, you can calculate it, and you can plot it. This is what I get. The plots look like that. I don't think there was a, I haven't seen your, your results yet, so I don't know if you had a problem with that, but that's what I'm getting. For phi 2 and for sigma, phi 2 versus potential. Uh -oh. You can calculate or use a table. You should get the same result. All right.